Okay, so picture this, right? Hurricane's coming. You're like, hunker down, no power. Yeah. And uh, and then you realize, like, the worst part, it's not the wind or the rain. Mm. It's that you can't even, like, shower, you know, because you're on your period. Oh, wow. Yeah, I see. Not, like, the first thing most people would think about during a hurricane, I guess. Right, right. But this is... Like, exactly what happened to me during Hurricane Barrel in Jamaica. Right. It really, like, huh. it was like a wake-up call to, like, what period poverty actually means in a crisis. Yeah. It's a, it's definitely a perspective we don't always consider. Yeah. We tend to focus on, you know, the more immediate dangers, like the wind, the flooding. Right. But the aftermath. Yeah. Especially for people who already don't have, like, reliable access to water and sanitation. Yeah. That's a whole other set of challenges. And that's exactly what we're like diving into today. Okay. A firsthand account of riding out Hurricane Barrel while, you know, also dealing with Mother Nature on like two fronts. Right. And this wasn't just any storm. We're talking like Barrel was a Category 5 at its peak. Wow. Like 160 mile an hour winds ripping through the Caribbean. Yeah, that's intense. What really struck me reading this account was... um how this personal story highlights the unexpectedness of these events. Uh-huh. Like, the author mentions losing piped water before the hurricane even hit. Yeah, you're already on edge, right? You're mm-hmm. prepping for this, like, massive storm, mm-hmm. and then bam, no water. It's like that first domino falling, and then you just know. like Totally. A whole chain of events is about to unfold. Well, don't anticipate it. Yeah. And this wasn't like an isolated incident either. The yeah. um, Jamaica's National Water Commission, mm-hmm. they reported that something like 70% of their customers lost water access because of barrel. Seriously. And some areas were without water for weeks, even months. 70%. Like, wow. That's a lot. It makes you realize how vulnerable we are to these kinds of disruption. Absolutely. Like, you think you have everything under control. Yeah. The author talks about... Like using stored water, treating it to make sure it's safe. Right. But even then, like having to carefully ration it out for drinking, cooking, and of course, hygiene. Yeah. Resourcefulness becomes like absolutely crucial in these situations. Right. But imagine trying to manage your period with like barely any water. I mean, right. Pads, cups, wipes, it all requires water for hygiene. Yeah. On top of the discomfort, you know, the stress of a leaking roof. Right. All the anxiety from the storm itself. Exactly. So the author uses this great phrase. I love it. Oh, yeah. She says, as Jamaicans say, we clean up the possibles. (laughs) I like that. It really speaks to that, like, resilience, Mm -hmm. you know, that, like, making do with what you have. It's powerful. A testament to human adaptability. Right. But, you know, this story is, like bigger than just this one person's experience. I know. It really is. But it, it raises all these questions about how other people, especially people already facing period poverty, right? how did they cope with this disaster? Exactly. Which is a good point, I think, to define what we mean by period poverty. Okay. Yeah. Because it's not just about, you know, lacking sanitary products. Right. It's about the lack of access to hygiene facilities, mm. information. Yeah. The resources to manage menstruation with dignity. Yeah. And I think what Hurricane Barrel did was it like shined this harsh light on the pre-existing realities of period poverty Mm. and how natural disasters can really amplify these inequalities that are already there. And it's like it's important to remember, you know, events like Hurricane Barrel, they don't like create these inequalities. They just like make them worse, like magnify them. All those existing vulnerabilities, poverty, lack of access to resources, Mm -hmm. it all becomes like way more intense in a crisis. It's like the hurricane rips the Band-Aid off, you know, Mm -hmm. exposes these issues that might have gone unnoticed otherwise. Exactly. It really underscores the need for um, like a more holistic approach to disaster preparedness. One that actually takes into account the specific needs of vulnerable populations. So what would that look like? A more uh, holistic approach in this context? Well, it starts with recognizing that, like, everyone has different needs during an emergency. Right. You know, for someone experiencing period poverty, access to clean water and sanitation becomes even more critical. Yeah, that makes sense. We often think about, like, stockpiling food and water, but Mm -hmm. hygiene needs are just as important. Absolutely. It's about building, like, community resilience. Okay. Investing in infrastructure that can withstand these extreme weather events. All right. Ensuring equitable access to resources and, like, Mm -hmm. empowering communities to be prepared. 
and respond effectively. So it's not just about like individual preparedness. It's mm -hmm. about creating a system where everyone is supported. Exactly. And that includes things like uh, making sure shelters are equipped with adequate sanitation facilities, yeah. providing access to free menstrual products, right. and like disseminating information about menstrual hygiene in a way that's, you know, culturally sensitive and accessible. These are such practical considerations. Yeah. But they're often overlooked. I know. We tend to focus on the big picture, but yeah. it's the details that can really make a difference. For sure. And it's crucial to remember, too, that these issues don't just, like, vanish once the immediate crisis is over. Right. The effects of a disaster, especially for marginalized communities, yeah. they can linger for years. Absolutely. That brings up an important question, then. How can we ensure that the needs of um, those experiencing period poverty aren't forgotten? like in the long-term recovery process? It requires a shift in perspective, I think. Okay. We need to move beyond just providing aid okay. and focus on empowering these communities yeah. to rebuild in a way that addresses their specific needs and vulnerabilities. So it's about collaborating with communities, understanding their challenges, mm -hmm. and supporting their like long-term recovery goals. Mm -hmm. Precisely. And that's where you know personal stories like the one we're discussing become so vital. Yeah. They help us understand the human impact of these disasters and remind us that recovery isn't just about rebuilding structures. It's about rebuilding lives. Exactly. Yeah. It sounds like resilience isn't just about, you know, bouncing back. Right. It's about bouncing forward, mm -hmm. like learning from these experiences and rebuilding right. in a way that's stronger and more equitable. Exactly. And this account we've been talking about, it really shows how interconnected everything is. Yeah. Climate change, disaster preparedness, social equity. Yeah. We can't really address one without thinking about the others, you know? It's a powerful reminder that climate change, like, it doesn't just impact the environment. Right. It has these deep social and personal consequences. For sure. Especially for those who are, like, already facing disadvantages. Absolutely. And it's a call to action, I think, yeah. for all of us. Yeah. We all have a role to play in building more resilient communities and making sure that everyone has access to those essential resources. Especially during a crisis. Exactly. So as we wrap up our uh, deep dive into this topic, yeah. what's the one thing you hope our listeners you know, take away from this conversation? Well, I hope it leaves them asking themselves, how can I contribute to a world where everyone has the resources and support they need mm -hmm. to weather any storm, <laughs> you know, literally and figuratively. Yeah, I like that. It starts with empathy, uh -huh, awareness, yeah. and a willingness to act. Beautifully put. We can't just wait for the next hurricane, right? Uh -huh. We need to be proactive, build those connections, yeah. advocate for change. Exactly. Because everyone deserves, you know, the dignity of clean water and essential resources. For sure. No matter what life throws their way. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive up